Cabinet appointment in April 2019 uh, after 35 years in the UK Defence Medical Services. Uh, and I'm joined on this um, seminar with the author of the book, um, Age Cthulhu. Uh, he served in the British Army for 25 years, uh, reaching the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. And during his military career, he served across the world, including on operations in Baghdad and Kosovo, uh, of which his book is the subject. After attending Staff College and becoming a master's graduate of King's College London uh, and commanding his regiment, he then led the UK's defence policy and planning for the Horn of Africa over the period 2010 to 2012, deploying to the region on several occasions. And since leaving the military, he's worked on a number of security sector related roles, including delivering strategic communications in Somalia for the United Nations and conducting defence reform in the Middle East. And he currently works in the cybersecurity industry. Uh, and he started writing this book in 2015, um, and it's been recently published, and it's his first book. So what we will do is uh, Aid will provide a short overview um, of the book, uh, and then I'll ask him some more detailed questions uh, about the content of the book, in particular his own personal experiences. Uh, and then we will um, open up for a uh, question and answer session. This um, seminar is being recorded, um, and so uh, if you don't want that to, um, to be involved in that, then please um, uh, log out. And if you want to pose questions, please can you pose them in the question and answer section in, the, in Zoom? Uh, and I will uh, read out your questions um, for aid to give a response. We have in the past tried to do this by clicking on people um, for visual and verbal cues, but that becomes very complicated. And so we found it much easier just to be able to do this by, uh, by text. So with that as an introduction, um, I'll hand over to Aid to give us a, a short overview uh, to his book and his experiences from the time that he was uh, in Kosovo um, during the period that he wrote uh, about which he's written his book. So Aid, over to you. Uh, Martin, thank you very much indeed, and, and hopefully um, you can hear me okay. Um, I think before I do the uh, or give the introduction to the book, I, I just want to thank everybody for uh, joining the uh, the event this evening. Uh, I know that there are people who um, certainly intended to join from uh, from the states, uh, from Europe, and and from Kosovo as well, uh, as well as here in the UK. So, uh, for all of you. Uh, for taking the time to come and to come and join us, uh, I, I really appreciate that. So, so thank you very much indeed. Um, Under a feathered sky, the untold story of NATO's role in newly independent Kosovo was, um, like most people will say about a book, an absolute labour of love, and uh, and took about four or five years to get to the stage where I was able to, to um, be comfortable publishing it. Um, it is a narrative non-fiction, first-hand account of NATO's uh, new tasks, security sector transition in Kosovo in uh, 2008, 2009. Um, I was very well placed to, to see this transition uh, in action. I was posted to Kosovo after Staff College as the uh, effectively NATO's liaison officer to the much revered Kosovo Protection Corps the KPC, which um, by quirk of, of international agreement um, was in decline in terms of it was on its way out and it was uh, going to be replaced by a new uh, civilian-led multi-ethnic um, security force uh, with about two and a half thousand personnel. At the time that I arrived there were about three thousand uh, 200 or so in the Kosovo Protection Corps uh, and it was never going to be a like-for-like like, um, transition. It, it, it was a case of, uh, of, of you had to apply from one to get into the, into the other. So, so why was the KPC um, having to close? Uh, Kosovo declared independence on the 17th of February 2008 and as part of the Atasari plan, which was signed off by the United Nations. On 
Kosovo declaring independence, the UN administered Kosovo Protection Corps, which had its roots uh, back in 1999, post war with Serbia. The, the UN administered KPC uh, had to close um, at a certain date in 2009, in June 2009, to be replaced by the civilian led uh, security force. So when I arrived in August, um, the, the pressure was already on for the organization to be, uh, to be closed. But decisions still hadn't been made about whether or not uh, the, the, the mechanism for that to take place. Uh, and about a week after I arrived in Kosovo, the, there was a, what was called in NATO circles, a change of command ceremony. Uh, and the NATO force in Kosovo, uh, what, what was called the International Military Presence, um, which was led by NATO uh, forces, was 16,000 strong in August 2008. And the leadership of K4, as it was called, Kosovo force, rotated annually. So I arrived with a French three-star general commanding with his command team. And I arrived, uh, and then a week later, um, there was a change of command ceremony and an Italian three-star general and his command team moved in. And it was going to be on this particular command team's watch that the new task security sector transition was going to be, uh, was going to be, uh, was going to have to happen. And so my role as the, as the liaison officer was um, was to be embedded, effectively embedded with the commander of the KPC, a three-star general, and with his deputy, who was a, a two-star. I, I was living in the NATO barracks in Pristina, uh, but spending all my time with my driver, uh, my driver bodyguard, uh, and our car, and my interpreter. Um, we would spend all our time um, supporting the KPC uh, generals. So, so that's the that's the the the, the context of, of of what really I suppose the question of why I was able to write this book and and why I had such a good view of of what was happening. Um, the most important thing, uh, or, or one of the most more important things, was when the Atasari plan ex uh, set out that a security force would be established and that the KPC would be dissolved. It laid executive authority at the door of the international military presence. So in other words, K4. When NATO made their announcement in June of 2008 that they were going to uh, conduct the new tasks um, security sector transition, they changed the language and they used the word supervise. Now, um, Although that may not appear to be a particularly important uh, different differential in terms of English language, but to supervise, uh, essentially to, to choose that language meant that K4 um, had, a, had much more uh, wriggle room, if, if, if you understand that phrase, um, in terms of how much they had to get involved in um, making these, this security transition actually work because of course dissolving and closing the KPC and uh, and setting up and putting in place everything that needed to happen to to uh, create a new force was incredibly interlinked and dependent on one another uh, so it was it was the, the dissolving of the KPC the setting up of the KSF the Kosovo security force and the third task in the new tasks was to establish a ministry, a government ministry that would oversee and lead the KSF. So I was in the heart of this. Um, the decision to supervise essentially meant that, in my view, it, gave, it, 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 it allowed the command team in, in Kosovo at the time to, they were off the hook, uh, basically. And, uh, and my observations were that there was a, um, a lack of leadership and commitment to those new tasks, which led to quite a severe impact on the very people who the security transition was uh, was focused. Uh, and as I'm sure we're going to discuss uh, as we go through this talk, um, 
I wasn't willing to stand by and see that happen. And as a result of that, I realized within a couple of weeks that what I was seeing was book worthy. Uh, so from that moment on, I, I, I kept extensive notes uh, and, and, and the book is, is a result of, uh, of, of, of spending my six months in that role in Kosovo uh, over that period. Uh, and, um, and I hope that, that that sets the context for, for, for what's to come, Martin. So thanks, um, Aid, for that uh, introduction. Perhaps um, you might be able to just provide a little bit of uh, a sort of wider context as to why that, why the six months you're describing was so important. Because of course, the the actual combat operation was uh, in in 1999 when um, the NATO forces uh, effectively using the threat of military power. Uh, persuaded the Serbians to withdraw and yet a decade later you're talking about now a sort of um, security and political transition so how how do how does that sort of um, time period link both to that uh, time of transition from 1999 to 2008 09 and indeed you know where we are now a further decade later so the the when I arrived in in, in Kosovo and, and joined uh, effectively got to know the KPC as well as I did, um, there was still a degree of euphoria post independence. Um, the The decision to uh, to to um, to declare independence from Serbia was was something that um, most Kos Kosovans had been looking forward to for quite a long time but they also knew that that once that decision was uh, was made there would be uh, some implications for the kpc and and maybe it's worth a moment just to go back to where the kpc came from um, in in the years leading up to 1999 um, uh, the kosovo liberation army um, had grown in importance as a as a means of of demonstrating um, resistance to to the activities of uh, of of Serbian forces in in the in Kosovo. Um, post war, um, it became clear that there were a lot of members of the Kosovo Liberation Army who who needed to be uh, who needed to undergo demobilization disarmament and reintegration into society uh, and follow the a, a sort of classic ddr process um, and the commander of K, k4 troops at the time was a british general who whose uh, who, whose team uh, came up with the idea of creating the kosovo protection corps uh, which was a, essentially a civil emergency organization and and over the course of its 10-year um, life had uh, demonstrated its worth both inside Kosovo in times of crisis but also uh, cross-border um, particularly in Albania where they deployed to support Albanian forces uh, when there was a crisis uh, over the border. So the, the, the complications of having a thousands of uniformed individuals knowing that their fate was um, was 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 not guaranteed in, in terms of of the uh, imposition of the new tasks. Uh, this created an environment of, of quite a lot of nervousness, and uh, and actually there was also a degree of apathy because those who were within the Kosovo Protection Corps could see the the, the what they were trying to achieve, uh, and there were others who perhaps didn't necessarily believe that they would be part of the future. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, although there were over 3,000 members of the KPC, and although the new force was going to be 2,500 strong, the idea was not to recruit 2,500 straight away from the Kosovo Protection Corps. It was to recruit about 1,500 who would go from one organization to the other. Um, of course, 
the and, it, and we we may touch on this in questions perhaps, but the the, the desire of Kosovans is for them to have an army, um, but of course with with current uh, the current sensitivities around negotiations over uh, a a sustainable uh, arrangement uh, for Kosovo's uh, future in relation to Serbia and and the challenges that exist around that particular issue. Um, the the Kosovo security force was seen as a good stepping stone on the journey towards uh, declaring uh, an army, uh, and and so there was a great deal of commitment from those who wished to make this work from within the Kosovan community, um, and it needed strong leadership to to make the as I say very complex transition work one that was completely interdependent from the KBC and the KSF um, and and so that context itself um, really I was thrown into the deep end of that uh, and and even by the time I left as as uh, perhaps those who've read the book um, it, it was still we were still in a place of of, of considerable um, chaos uh, even at the very uh, the very beginning of, of the KSF's uh, existence uh, in early 2009. Uh, hopefully that's answered the question. So that very nicely sets the sort of strategic context and the uh, effectively the importance of getting the, the culture of security organizations right, both in terms of the, the individual people uh, and also their, their role within the constitution. I wonder if you could now um, perhaps unpick a little bit more about your very specific role and um, the, the nature of your loyalties um, in regard to um, you, you know, what job you were there to do and whom you were there to support. So I arrived in Kosovo very keen to make a difference to those who I was going to be working with. That was my primary aim. I had read extensively before arriving in Kosovo, so the, uh, the, the the historical and cultural context was was at the forefront of my mind. But I was also very aware that the Kosovo Protection Corps had been something of a uh, a, a, a creation of, of of in a way the British. Uh, although I wouldn't wish to 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 make that claim that it was only a British idea, but. Um, but we had a very close relationship, um, the British military and uh, the KPC, we had a very close relationship and therefore my, um, you know, I had a degree of loyalty even, you know, on the very first day when I stepped off the plane to making um, the, the, the closed, the, the, essentially the close down of the KPC, uh, I wish to make that as dignified as possible. Uh, and to make the, the creation of the KSF, as far as my influence would, would uh, allow, to be uh, efficient, effective, and successful. Uh, and, and so that's how, when I arrived in Kosovo, that was, that was my start point. Um, I, I've already said that within a couple of weeks, I realized that I, what I was seeing was bookworthy. And the reason I made that decision was because I was quite bemused by the behaviors of, of the new command team that had arrived in Kosovo uh, a week after I'd arrived. Um, I very quickly got a sense that they were not really committed to the new tasks. Um, it was the biggest security transition, biggest event in security terms that had happened in Kosovo for many years, uh, and although uh, and, and although the, the K4's mission in Kosovo, and it remains so, um, was to to ensure safe and secure uh, to ensure a safe and secure environment and a freedom of movement, what was colloquially known as safe form. Um, I very quickly got the impression that that the security transition, the new tasks was going to impact on what was um, pretty much a, you know, a routine tour. Um, everybody doing their best to make sure that, uh, that, that, 
that Safe's form was was delivered, um, but but leading and providing the leadership and ensuring that the new tasks were uh, implemented successfully, uh, I, I definitely got a sense that that wasn't on their agenda. And and, and whilst they perhaps um, um, paid lip service to it, um, I could see that that things would would go wrong very quickly. And and so I was I suppose I was faced with a dilemma because. Quite early on in my tour, I was I was pulled up by one individual who said, uh, "Your job as a liaison officer is to sit and be quiet in a corner and just report on what you see." Um, and it was clear I was never going to do that, uh, and I needed to make a decision uh, about whether I was going to essentially follow follow orders or um, ensure that that I could shape events in in the favour. Uh, in, in favour of the Kosovans who were subject to this transition and, and that really that set the course for the for the remainder of my of my tour. So one of the things that um, comes out in your book is the quite complicated nature of the stakeholder, should we call it the stakeholder environment that you were operating in, um, that uh, not only between you and NATO, but of course NATO is composed of um, nations, not all of whom would necessarily have um, a unified perspective on the uh, political intention. And then even inside uh, you know, the sort of Kosovo political elite that you were able to, to work with, there were competing um, factions uh, in, that type, in that grouping as well. So how, how do you did you get your sense of sort of compass to to navigate uh, across these um, competing uh, political stakeholders? Uh, I was, um, it, you, you were right, uh, it, it was a very complex stakeholder map and I think I made it, I made it a lot more complex than perhaps um, previous incumbents into my, in my position had uh, perhaps uh, enjoyed. Um, Yes, I needed to maintain relations with my NATO superiors because I was working for them. Uh, I was reporting to them and I was their eyes and ears within the organisation that was subject to the transition. Um, things weren't particularly good in the KPC at that time and there were, uh, there were worries and concerns about the impact of their, uh, of their attitude and behaviour uh, on um, the safe and so secure environment within Kosovo, and so, you know, this was the this was the the, the lens through which they were looking at this transition. Um, but I was blessed with having a, an absolutely brilliant interpreter who had been the had been the interpreter to, to my role uh, over the previous eighteen liaison officers over the previous nine years, uh, and he was um, who he didn't know. Uh, in Kosovo in this little black book well really they weren't worth knowing and so we were able to and, and I I felt that I needed to get a greater context about what was happening and a greater context to understand as much as I could new in country having read up in advance but there were so many subtleties um, w w within within the, the society itself uh, and where there were um, family relations, of course, uh, and uh, and so there was a uh, there was a kind of a, a life, you know, a life underneath what most, uh, I suppose, most uh, visitors to, to Kosovo would see, and I, I wanted to get a sense of, of what was happening. So I was able to, through my interpreter Simi, I was able to uh, reach out to political leaders, and I met them initially nervously and um, trying to do it in a sort of relatively incognito way but it became clear to me that you know politics local politics was also being was also playing a part in the behaviors that started to appear uh, as we went through this uh, this process and so whether it was my place or not, and I suspect it probably wasn't my place to deliver certain messages, but I, I had to deliver them nonetheless. Um, I, I described one 
30 minute meeting is probably the most uncomfortable I've ever had in my life. And I think even now, even to this very day, I, I, I still stand by that because it was a, uh, because it was, it was a very challenging um, subject to talk to somebody about, somebody who was very important in, in Kosovan society. But what drove me, where my compass was, as you describe it, was that I wanted to ensure that this whole process was done with as much dignity as possible. And that I wanted the people I was working with, the Kosovans I was working with, to know that I was on their side. That whereas there were many, many examples where, frankly, the, the, the behavior and attitudes were, were very poor towards the Kosovan people, I was not going to be part of that. And I uh, absolutely made a point that that would be uh, that that wouldn't be how I behave, and and so I suppose that that's what drove me, uh, that sense of um, you know, of, of of understanding. We we had a strategic relationship, uh, the UK and Kosovo, and I wanted to maintain that as as best I could. I'll just pose you one more question. There's a couple of questions now coming up on the um, in the Q and A box. So I'll then move on to those. So so my sort of final question um, to you is: How would you see this book? fitting into you know the picture of security sector reform and you know why might somebody read this rather than a, a book by a retired general or a senior politician okay good question um uh, so i mean i i wanted to write a book that could be read by uh, people who perhaps have got absolutely nothing have had no experience of of security sector reform, no experience of of, uh, of even the military or diplomacy overseas. Um, I just I wanted to write it in a way that told a story about a particular period in a particular country, but to tell it in a way that was um, as engaging as I could make it, but also entirely true to life. Uh, and and whilst I uh, I was. Aware, I also, of course, wanted to um, to to attract other audiences. Primarily, I wanted to write a book that, that was accessible, because the book is for the people of Kosovo, and I wanted the people of Kosovo to have the opportunity, perhaps when it's translated, to understand what really happened over that period, because. There was so much going into the news through headlines, and there was so much, there was so much activity in the media. Um, people who perhaps didn't have very much to do with the KPC or indeed the KSF probably got the wrong impression of what was happening. And and I I, I feel very strongly, or I felt very strongly, that actually what what I wanted to do was was kind of put the real story out there because um, you know that definitely hadn't been told at the time. Now, in terms of professionals who are studying security sector reform, um, military folk who are going to potentially deploy into these environments where you're trying to win the peace post-conflict, um, I mean, there, there are some key lessons, I think, that, that fall out of, of that. Uh, and, I, and I think, um, Primarily, it's to be successful where there is um, uh, ambiguity, where there is, uh, there is uh, you know, a real sense of, of a conflict of interests and, and, and priorities within the stakeholder community. Um, and we haven't talked about the, the, non -rec the role of the non-recognizing countries in, in K4 and, and how that's impacted on things. But, Without leadership um, and without a very clear um, mandate, then you are going to find that things don't work as well as they should do. And at that particular time, it was clear to me that there was a lack of leadership. There was a lack of commitment. And there, was also a, there were also, I think, some very poor decisions made, um, whether in Brussels, uh, whether in Naples, which, uh, which was the, the immediate higher authority to, to, uh, to uh, K4 in Pristina, 
but the 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 comms that underpinned what we were trying to do were absent and uh, as the book explains i i try to fill that gap and and fill that vacuum um but but without explaining to people what it is that you are trying to do without being committed to what it is that you want to do and taking people with you and understanding the culture in which you are operating um, particularly when dealing with with local politicians and senior uh, senior politicians uh, within the country that you are deployed to you're really on a hiding to nothing and i and i think you you may well read in a general's a book about a general's reflections on on various campaigns you will see it from a a very senior bird's eye view um, but I know that there is no book similar to this about Kosovo that tells a story of, of really what was happening on the ground. Um, and, and I think it's, it's vitally important that, that people get a sense of, of what's really happening behind the headlines. And, and I suppose, although this is 12 years ago that, that uh, these events were taking place, um, they're still very relevant. And they're particularly relevant, I think, because Kosovo remains in a, uh, a, a, a state of, um, uh, of a uh, flux in a way um, because it's still um, we're, we're still waiting to to be able to to move forward with uh, with Kosovo so that it can and grow and develop into a, a respected independent independent nation. So let me uh, pick up some questions and indeed if anybody else wants to type uh, some questions into the Q&A please do so. It, it would be helpful if you could um, make them attributable in some way so that um, aid's able to understand uh, perhaps a bit more of the background to the question. So the first question is from somebody you mentioned in your book, uh, Colonel Terry Anderson, who was a US military attache in Kosovo 2008-2009. And his question is, has your assessment of K4's reasoning for accommodating what they considered the bigger picture of non-recognizing countries, for instance, keeping Serbia from going um, becoming further aligned to Russia, adjusted over time. So I put the question again. Um, so has, has your assessment yeah, of KFOR's reasoning at the time for accommodating what they considered to be the bigger picture of non-recognizing countries um, changed? And that's you know your assessment of what it looks like 2008 to how you've seen things um, since. And, and in your book, you, you mentioned about going back to Kosovo um, yourself, uh, I think 2018 or something. Hmm. Um, Terry, thanks for the question. And, and that's uh, a, very, a very good question. So really, I was quite exasperated, uh, as I'm sure you, you remember, um, at the time by the the, the preference to accommodate the the um, the, the non-recognizing countries within K4 and to essentially play a role that kept them quiet and content, um, but as a result of that, there was there was this lack of commitment that I talked about um, to the new tasks. Um, lots of rumours abounded uh, about certain countries and and how they were. Um, less than supportive of uh, of the of all the work in the background that was required to set up uh, and, and and launch the Kosovo security force. Um, at the time, there was um, there were there were a degree of, I guess, uh, understanding that Serbia was quite keen to to be. Um, moving closer to the European Union and to Europe, and um, and and I would imagine that there was there was some um, some influence over uh, certain individuals' behaviours um, because they they didn't want to uh, upset Serbia. But of course, over time that has uh, shifted significantly. Um, whether or not the uh, attitudes and behaviors of those non-recognizing countries within nato within k4 and now within the european union whether that has in any way changed well the only way that that can materially change is for those countries to recognize kosovo 
um, and uh, and to to pin their pin their flag to the mast, so to speak. Um, but I think, if anything, the the situation has become uh, more complex to try and resolve um, over over time. And and although there's been a a push in the last few months to make some progress, there is there are significant blockers. Uh, that still exists, which I suspect will be um, will be generational in in their in their resolution. I hope that answers your question, Terry. But please do um, come back to me if 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 I didn't quite uh, I didn't quite answer answer answer. So the next question is uh, posted by um, a person by the name of Elliot. Uh, it, it reads: You clearly took stock of the situation on arrival and developed your strategy for the role. Uh, by the looks of it, with limited oversight or guardrails. Do you think that such independent thinking is a tradition of British military officers? And is this admired locally or externally? Or is it usually um, restricted or perhaps um, more directly guided? And I guess this touches on the sort of philosophy of mission command and uh, perhaps, you know, a little bit of cultural difference between um, different militaries. So, uh, Elliot, thank you. That's a brilliant question. Um, Mission Command is very much a, a case of, uh, and it's it's very it's entirely embedded within British military culture, that you under you very clearly understand what it is that you need to achieve, um, and with with perhaps a few uh, restrictions, you, you're um, you're expected to get on and find a way of of achieving that. And and of course, that that uh, Mission Command is. Is, is effective from a, a sort of large set piece type of, of military action um, right down to a single individual who understands what needs to be done um, and uh, and also um, but but is but is willing to do whatever it takes to achieve that and I suppose that's where I was in in in, in that uh, uh, in that um, uh, the, the sort of spectrum of what mission command means um, I, I was it does go back actually to to when I was doing my MA um, at Staff College that I I read extensively about the Great Game and, and 19th century Afghanistan and the the role of British army officers who would um, who who knew the big picture they knew what they needed to achieve um, but with absolutely no oversight at all barely any resources in place for them uh, they would they would head off uh, into into the, uh, the 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 hinterland of uh, of Afghanistan and uh, and 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 do what they needed to do to achieve what they believed to be the strategic goal and and I suppose um, romantically I was quite impressed by that and and uh, I do say in the book that I, I I really wanted to find somewhere post staff college where I could perhaps try and you know enact this a little bit. Um, uh, but actually, I found that in Kosovo, it was entirely appropriate to to have that freedom of uh, that freedom of action um, because if you are constrained by what your orders are, then you you are you are by the very nature of of that phrase, you are going to be very constrained in how effective you can be. Now, as Martin suggested. Um, there was a there was a clash of cultures in Kosovo. Um, pretty much everywhere you looked, uh, there was a clash of cultures between um, between uh, British the British military and other militaries within that K four environment. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, I saw my role as as the liaison officer much more as a mentor, uh, as a as a guide, as as somebody who was going to be able to give advice. Uh, and somebody who could, you know, absorb the, you know, the, the, the frustrations as much as offer solutions. Um, but as I said earlier, the, I was told very clearly, very early on, that, that was absolutely not what was, what was expected of me. And, uh, and I was certainly not going to uh, abide by that. Uh, and so I think if you know what it is that you need to achieve, um, frankly, uh, you know, within the realms of of keeping yourself safe, I think you will do whatever it is that you can to achieve that, and um, and that was the approach that I took, and 
Um, and, and who knows, uh, I, I'm probably not the one to judge whether it was successful or not, but, um, but the, the Kosovo Security Force, um, 10 years on, 10 years plus uh, since it was formed, is in rude health. Uh, and is itching to become an army and uh, and, it, and it's you know what we went through over that winter um, perhaps uh, did demonstrate that um, that you know we, we did in the end produce something that has become very very good and I'm very proud of what the care staff has become. So a further question um, this is from um, a person called Magda from Albania uh, who thanks you for your presentation um, they're a major in the Albanian Armed Forces and has deployed four times to Kosovo uh, as part of K4. Um, and there are three questions. What I'll do is give them to you individually so you can answer them uh, in turn. Um, the first one, uh, which is, what, looking back, what was the most um, challenging issue that you faced in your role in that transition from the Kosovo Protection Force to the Kosovo Security Forces? You, know, you described a lot of challenges. Is there any one that particularly, you know, uh, is the biggest highlight? Um, Magda, thank you very much indeed for that question. Um, yes, uh, there, there were there were there were many. Um, I, I think. one of the probably one of the most important issues that i picked up quite early on and, and the reason that i'm probably giving this as the answer now was because it, it had such an impact on so many people um, and that was the fact that there was no effective comms campaign there was no real strategic messaging that um, was coming out of of, uh, of nato slash k4 uh, even though I think there were plans for that to be happening, but it, it never really materialized on the ground. And so the, the people in uh, the, the, the members of the Kosovo Protection Corps, who uh, frankly were very nervous about their future because Kosovo didn't have uh, a great employment record, um, opportunities were very limited, uh, and, and they, they genuinely didn't know what was going to be happening to them. Um, and so I think. The most challenging thing was trying to get the message out there uh, and I, I turned to some fairly um, interesting methods to do that but but but, it, but I felt that that was one of the most uh, one of the most um, the most important actually I've got two can I say two Martin can I say yeah, two? Um, so there were two things that I found challenging. That was the first um, from a professional perspective. Um, but I found uh, maintaining my relationships um, back home to my family uh, also very, very difficult because I was under such pressure uh, on a day to day basis. I was often phoning at the wrong time. My children were very young at the time. And there were times when um, a bad phone call with my family back home or with my kids uh, would have a, a, a disproportionate effect on me in Kosovo and and those were some very some very difficult times uh, for me um, so hopefully well you've got two answers for the price of one then. okay so the second question is is um, are you able to give any um, sort of practical or, or sort of precise um, uh, descriptions of, of where you know, the behavior of uh, representatives of NATO states that didn't recognize Kosovo seemed to be a constraint or an obstacle to this transition process? Um, when the Kosovo Protection Corps was uh, operating normally. Um, the, the, the way that K4 was organized, it was organized uh, geographically um, in line with the, the KPC protection zones. So um, a, a Kosovo, a KPC protection zone would have a, a sort of a, a partner K4 unit that would provide them with support um, with uh, 
military support uh, and, and the relationship was always very good. Um, there was also uh, a fund that had been set up, uh, a NATO fund that had been set up um, for the Kosovo Protection Corps to, to support uh, the payment of pensions, um, the, the, um, to allow them to undergo uh, resettlement training if they were not successful in getting into the KSF. Um, and that fund was, uh, was full. Um, it, it was, there was a target amount and it was um, full. Um, but uh, there was also a NATO fund for the Kosovo Security Force and that wasn't very well supported. Um, it was not full of money um, because, it, it, because it, it was not, because it was too politically sensitive for some countries to commit to it, yet they did commit to the KPC trust fund. When the Kosovo Protection Corps closed at midnight on, on, uh, on, that, on that midnight in January 2009 and the Kosovo Security Force um, came into being a minute later, um, some of these K4 units stopped supporting the KSF. Uh, in terms of their local, what would, would, were their local protection zones in the KPC era, the following day there was a reluctance to do so because the KSF for anybody in Kosovo was uh, a, 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 an instrument of government. Um, but the, for those who didn't recognise Kosovo, um, nobody would ever refer to Kosovo as the government of Kosovo. They would only ever refer to the institutions of Kosovo uh, and that that pervaded uh, K4 uh, and so so that that's an example of 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 how um, how how I guess what we were trying to achieve with the Kosovo security force was undermined by um, by some of these 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 behaviors that as I say were, were quite pervasive at the time uh, and the final question of the three. So, so you went back in, I think it was 2018, to uh, to catch up with some various people. How how did you um, sort of detect the um, the progress that had been made in in um, setting up the, the KSF and how it was operating? And and do you think that um, there is a, a reasonable possibility of it becoming more than it currently is? Um. So again, thanks, thank, thank you, Magda, for that. Um, I, I was, uh, I was in the Land Forces Command headquarters on its first day in two thousand and nine, and it was chaos. And of course, a lot of the behaviours uh, that had crept into life within the Kosovo Protection Corps um, just clearly, just immediately, just uh, continued the following day, uh, even though. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd had many conversations with the, the now commander of the KSF, uh, General Rama, uh, about how things needed to be different from day one. And he was absolutely determined to ensure that that was the case. Um, and, I, and I left uh, within two or three, two, within a, a month or so of, the, of, that, uh, of, the start, of the start of the KSF. Uh, and uh, and the, as I say, the, it was it was still a fairly chaotic environment for a number of reasons, um, and so when I left, I, I I felt quite down in the mouth about what we had done. I didn't really get a sense of of, uh, of it becoming anything uh, particularly uh, effective. But then I I went back in 2018. I went I went back to meet uh, the uh, land force commander who I knew who I'd known nine years previously. Um, I arrived at exactly the same barracks. It was smart. It was ordered. Um, you know, just a small thing. Uh, for, for even for the Balkans, there was no smoking in or around the buildings. Um, there was a a real sense of purpose, and and so much had progressed that I got a real sense that actually this was perfect for Kosovo. What um, what the, the Kosovo Security Force had done it, it created this opportunity as a as I guess a stepping stone to to much greater things, um, their 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 um, program of of sending um, young officers out to training institutions uh, 
uh, around the world, particularly in the States, at West Point, at Sandhurst in the UK, uh, and, and elsewhere in, in other capitals, uh, and, and winning best international students. I mean, th th these are great accolades for what is a very small country, a relatively small country. And so they have, I think they have to be um, really congratulated for their determination to make the, the Kosovo security force as it is actually, I, I think the, the, the most respected um, government organization in Kosovo. Uh, and, and so I was really heartened by that. And it did give me a sense that, um, that it had all been worth it. So what about the future? Well, I, I, I was uh, I was um, I was interviewed by um, by Bern, the, the Balkans media um, online media organisation, a, a few weeks ago, and I was asked the question: um, Do I think that um, the status of uh, of Kosovo's army and the ability to create an army um, should be part of the uh, negotiations over its uh, its the, the issue of mutual recognition with serbia and and i said absolutely not um kosovo has the right to have its own army um it has the right to self-defense and uh, and i think that they have uh, grown and matured as an organization to the stage now that um it is a natural next step for them to 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 do that and um and I, I certainly, I certainly would support um, that initiative. There's a, there's a few more questions, so we'll keep running for um, you know, probably another uh, ten or fifteen minutes. Next question's from um, Agami, uh, Christina, um, and uh, the question is: uh, Do you think that the local officers and officials that you interacted with noticed um, a lack of commitment? from the uh, international presence towards this transition. Um, thank you, uh, Agnia, and I hope Pristina uh, still, uh, still, still hasn't been, um, I hope you haven't had the snowfall, I think that's what I mean, um, because it's probably gonna be coming around this sort of time of the year, isn't it? Um, but thank you for the question. Um, the, the, the honest answer is that I don't honestly think that many people got a sense of it. Um, I talked to, Rama on a number of occasions, General Rama, um, and recalled some of the, in my role as a liaison officer, I would pass messages from one side to the other, but I would also give us give a sense of, of what was happening. And, um, and when I raised this with him, he, uh, he had a bit of a trademark shrug of his shoulders. We just, he would just, what can we do? Because they, General Rama, General Salimi at the time, they knew that they were unequal partners with K4. Therefore, they had no real say at the table. I mean, to a degree they did, of course, but, but when it came down to it, the, some of these behaviors that I describe in the book, um, frankly, as, as Rama did say to me, there, there were just bigger things to worry about. And, and so I think the answer to your question is, I don't really think that many people got a sense of it outside of just uh, you know a handful who were at the very i guess at the very heart of those discussions um between uh, between k4 and, and the kbc at the time okay the next question is from uh florian chehaya i hope i pronounced that correctly from the kosovo center for security studies and a recent member of um rcds uh Royal college of defense studies here in london and the question is um this behavior amongst some NATO nations led to increased distrust of the locals towards NATO. And in short, there is much lower leverage now towards international stakeholders in Kosovo than during your time in 2008, 2009. From a Kosovan perspective, do you think they're better off pursuing bilateral partnerships rather than um, going with multinational organizations? Uh, Florian, that, that's a, that is, uh, I can tell you've been to RCDS, that's a, that's a very, uh, very good question. I think you have to accept that um, there are going to be organisations like the United, uh, like, like uh, the European Union, uh, are always going to have an interest in, in Kosovo. Um, 
as NATO has a, uh, a, a responsibility to deploy troops uh, as well as non-NATO nations in Kosovo. The, the way to unlock the impasse that exists at the moment uh, is, is going to take something pretty special from somebody. But I would urge um, Kosovo to not to necessarily put all their eggs in one basket, but you want to have people on your side. You want to have people who are genuinely committed to seeing an independent, sovereign nation in Kosovo. And whilst that is a laudable aim, um, you are going to, you are still going to have to rely on the support of, of, of groups of nations um, in, 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 in trying to achieve that. Um, but I, I've, back in 2008, 2009, um, the influence of those non-recognizing countries was quite clear. Um, and I think that, you know, you clearly want to be partnering with those who you think can, can make a difference for you because they believe in you. And I think if you uh, adopt that approach, um, then eventually you will you will achieve what it is that you need to achieve and and so um, so yeah I think that that there is a there's certainly a place for bilateral relations and strong bilateral relations as long as they are they are doing it for the the benefit of Kosovo uh, and not for any other any other motive. And uh, and the final question uh, from um, Russell Motler. Uh, really concerns, concerns about you really. You've spoken about the military impact, but how would you say your time in Kosovo affected you personally? Obviously enough to, to be motivated to write a book, but and, and, um, you know, in terms of um, you know, the nature of being away from your family for six months and having this stress and stuff, some thoughts about you know, the longer term impact beyond the six months you were there? Um, so th thank you, Russell. That, was a, that is uh, that is also, um, I guess, quite an apt question in, in many ways. When I um, when I eventually got back from uh, Kosovo in February '09, I really was in a bit of a state actually because um, because the the pressure that I had felt throughout the tour, which actually had manifested itself into an illness for me throughout and, and just an illness that I just needed to ignore because, um, because I, I, I knew I needed to, you know, keep on focused on what my mission was, but, um, but I had been unwell throughout the, the, the time. And, and um, so when I, uh, and, and that pressure was right up to the very last, almost the last day. Um, so I came back, uh, landed in the UK, um, I went off to go and to do the school run that afternoon. And I stood at the gates of the primary school uh, and, and I honestly felt like a complete alien because I didn't feel like I belonged uh, there. I, I, my head was still in Kosovo. Uh, I, and, and I was still, um, I was quite a mess to be honest. Um, I think the, the challenges on, on military, military personnel when they serve abroad, particularly if they do so in an individual post, which is what I was doing. I think sometimes if you deploy with a, a company, a regiment, a brigade, you know, you're surrounded by others and, and you have a, a camaraderie and a rapport and you can, you know, you can, you can deal with issues, I suppose, by talking to them and, and getting it off your chest. But um, I was definitely lacking in, uh, in, in an ability to offload what was happening. And I found it impossible to have those types of conversations um, with home for the, for the simple reason that it was so complex and it was so difficult to explain. Um, it, 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 you know, in itself, that caused some some real challenges, and and you know, it, it it is it is a feature of I guess anybody who serves overseas. Um, I was in the military, but uh, diplomats do the same, and and others who are who are working as contractors. Finding a release valve 
is uh, is is often the, the most challenging thing. And and then when you come back into your normal life, um, you don't want to feel like an alien every single day that you go to this on the school run. You want to um, you want to fit back in where you left off. But the more um, stressful and pressured the tour, uh, the longer that takes. And and sometimes perhaps we never really get over it. And maybe we still carry some of it with us today. And maybe I do. Um, it's a uh, it's a question that I think uh, you know is the subject of another ninety minute conversation. To be honest, so but thanks for asking it. So let's uh, close with one final question. Actually, links to um, uh, a question that's been um, also posted in the last few last few minutes. So from from this book, uh, and indeed from your own experiences, what do you think you can take forward? to um you know a, 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 the question relates to your corporate career and what you've learned but also you know what sort of other things can be extrapolated from the from the specific into you know the more general aspects of um operating in a very complex um social and political environment uh, for you mean for for, 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 for you me. personally uh, and then also for yep. you know for a reader mm. Um, well, I would, I would always, <laughs> I actually would absolutely guarantee that, uh, sorry, recommend that people, if people are in a position to, um, to make any sort of difference at all outside of their normal environment, I would always encourage them to try and do so. Um, for all of the, uh, the stress and the pressure that I, I lived through. Uh, in that six months, and and you know you you have your own experiences, Martin, and, and I'm sure others on the who are watching uh, have also done that. If you feel that you are making a difference, it is it is the most wonderful feeling, and it's a it's a great sense of satisfaction. It doesn't happen every day, uh, and sometimes you actually need to look back with some context before you can get a sense of actually I did move the dial a little bit forward in that in that way. So. When you've done it once or, or twice before, um, you do, in a way, want to. I'm not really clear at the moment, but what what it has made me think, uh, I guess, within a, a is that. Um, you can do a lot more than you perhaps believe and you can have um, more influence in, in certain environments than perhaps you believe that actually you, 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 you can do before because you've lived with others who are different to you, who have different cultures to you. But there is a common language and, and much of that is about uh, establishing relationships and, and listening and understanding what it is that they are trying to achieve and i think you know you can pick that up and you can just you can drop it into your own life and and so um i think that's probably probably where where i i would uh, i would say i'm sitting at the moment well with that um hey, thank you very much indeed for uh sharing with us your Look under a feathered sky, I think, um, and to discuss or uh, you're certainly encouraging anybody <laughs> who's interested in the process of security sector reform and the the peace building uh, after conflict to consider buying it and reading it as just one source of um, you know, a very personal record of your experiences uh, in your role in uh, Kosovo 2008 2009. And um, with that, thank you again, Aid. Thank you everybody for for joining us for this webinar. And um, and with Gosh, that, Martin. we'll thank close you. the session down. Thank you very much indeed.